Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming today, both virtually and in person, to spend time together at Pearl S. Buck International. My name is Anna Katz, and I will soon hit my six-month anniversary as CEO and President of Pearl S. Buck International. I am so honored to be here with you today. Later in the program, I will share with you a little bit about myself and my vision for the future of our organization. Right now, I want to introduce to you the next segment of our program. As you may know, the theme for today, today's event is What America Means to Me. It is an opportunity to reflect on and rekindle the passion we have for this wonderful country of ours, to contemplate both our strengths and our weaknesses. There's also a subcontext to this theme. When looking at our current conditions, there was a consensus among staff that there is something sorely missing in our everyday lives, namely the ability to agree to disagree and enter into dialogue with those that have differing points of view. I, recall, I can recall a time not too long ago when I can argue with Democrats, Republicans, sisters, fathers, mothers, aunts, uncles, and friends. And I was able to agree to disagree on a variety of issues. President George W. Bush, a Republican, captured this sentiment over the summer during John Lewis's funeral. When he reflected on his relationship with this Democratic congressman and civil rights leader, he said, John and I had our disagreements, of course, and then he chuckled a little bit. But in the America that John fought for, and the, the America I believe in, differences of opinion are inevitable and evidence of democracy in action. I just thought that was just profound. This is really what I think America is all about. Dialogue, this critical human faculty, allows us in some cases to agree on general principles and policies and disagree on particulars, or to do disagree in general and agree on particulars. The process sharpens our intellect and bridges distances. But in today's society, in which every issue, political or not, feels hyperpolarized, this now seems impossible. But this does not have to be inevitable. To remedy the situation, we look to Pearl S. Buck's wisdom. It seems that Miss Buck surely had skills, specifically in the ability to agree to disagree. This is keenly demonstrated as she articulates her interaction with a close friend, Eslana Robeson, in her book, The American Argument. Eslana Robeson was an African-American woman, anthropologist, author, actor, and civil rights activist. She was also a close friend of Pearl S. Buck. Two American women, both mature, successful, and holding no grudges against life, discuss their own country from differing and sometimes opposing, but always basic points of view. We share with you today an enactment of their dialogue. We hope it inspires you to begin your own dialogues and find your own abilities to agree to disagree. Before I invite Pearl and Aslana to join us, I want you to know if at any points during their dialogue that you feel uncomfortable, that is all part of the process. We need to learn how to come, to come out on the other side of uncomfortability, recognize differences, and reunite. Also, you may want to think about the similarities and differences the times portrayed. We are portraying 1948 and 1949 and we should compare that to our current times. Thank you very much. Now, please help me welcome Pearl and Islanda. Hello, Islanda. Islanda gave me great help in writing this book. Every time I began a sentence by saying, in our country, she stopped me firmly. Which country? She demanded. Your America and mine are not the same. At first, I found this interruption irritating. 
To define one's terms before one gets a chance to talk is to put a bridle on a horse. But I soon learned to be grateful for it. When I speak of America, I must define my terms because there is not one America. Maybe there is not any America at all. Maybe we are just a hodgepodge of people living upon one piece of earth through the accident of wandering forefathers. They came here and spawned us and died, leaving us without ancestry. To go back five or six generations does not mean a real ancestry. My friend Sung Shi Sing goes back 70 generations in his modest way. Maybe we are fish out of water. Anyway, here we are, as Landa is waiting attentively for me to begin. So let me ask you, Aslanda, what do you think when you think about being born in America? When I think about being born in America, I remember that I am officially described on my birth certificate as child, female, colored. In the United States, that airmarks the baby for discrimination, segregation, and injustice throughout life. Unless our society wants and intends to do something against babies because of their color. There's no reason to mark them down as colored or white. One of the earliest things I remember is playing with a little boy who lived across the street from us in Washington. We lived in a mixed neighborhood then. It was about the year 1900. The boy was white, but I had not yet realized there was any color difference between us. I am afraid I, I was a very independent, even sassy child. I always defended what I considered were my rights, and I still do. One day, while we were playing, I wanted my turn at something, a game or a toy. I don't remember exactly what it was. I had waited for my turn, but he would not let me have it. I insisted, and he got angry and called me a nasty name. I asked him what that meant. He said it meant something bad and something black. That infuriated me, for I knew I was not bad and I wasn't black. In the same year of 1900, when Aslanda first was told about her color by a white boy in Washington, I had my first great fear in China. White people there were being killed by brown people. They were being killed because some white people had done great wrong to the Chinese and anyone who was white stood in danger because of what a few bad white people had done. To me, then eight years old, it was a frightful revelation that children could be killed because of their parents, who in turn were killed because somewhere far away, other and entirely strange white people had been cruel and wicked. From that day on, I felt less secure in my life. If such a thing could happen in China, where little children were much loved, it could happen anywhere. Let's talk about opportunity, Aslanda. As an American, do you feel that there is unlimited opportunity here for anybody of color? I think there could be, but I think you have to insist on having the opportunity. And when you get it, you have to deliver. There are a lot of people here in this country actively and successfully preventing other people from getting normal opportunity. I cannot imagine anybody preventing Islanda from getting anything that she wants. I believe that if she had the chance to be born again into her own choice, she would still be herself. I'm sure she would like less difficulty in her life. She might, for all I know, to pr prefer to be tall and slim. But I do not believe it would occur to her to want to be white. Islanda, have we Americans real race prejudice? No, I don't think so. The reason I think we haven't is because there are too many organized efforts to create it and keep it up. We have to make real, we have to make Jim Crow laws and insist upon them. We have to make, have real estate agreements and insist upon them. It takes alert, consistent effort to preserve this so-called race prejudice, which is really economic at base. It is to the economic interest of persons or groups, mostly economic groups, to keep up these barriers of race. They have to work hard to keep them up because the barriers are artificial 
not real or natural. Prejudice is not innate. It is not inherited. It is taught. It is acquired. We Negroes are no longer surprised to find just before an election that suddenly everybody is interested in us as a group. There's a lot of talk about giving us our rights, but nothing ever comes of it. And we are no longer misled by it. In the current campaign, for instance, there is an unusual amount of interest being shown in many groups because this election is going to be a hard fight. Truman, who could have done a lot about civil rights along the way, suddenly made a grand gesture in setting up a civil rights commission. It made a lot of capital out of the report of this commission. And there is this elegant report on the state of education in our nation. Reports, reports, commissions, commissions, congressional investigations, and so what? All to impress the veterans, the young people, various minorities. We Negroes are not investigations that get nowhere. They have all petered out after elections. Anyway, every fool knows the State of the Union. We don't need any more committees, investigations, and reports. What we need is action, correction, and plenty of it, and fast. So where do we lose our sense of human relationships? Well, maybe we never had it. We began in this country with slavery, remember? It's impossible to develop human relationships or to keep them if we had them under slavery. Slavery itself is a violation of human relationships and sets up false standards. When people first came to America, they were interested in finding freedom from oppression for themselves or in building a better life for themselves. And they are still doing just that or trying to. So now we are on the merry-go-round of building, building more and bigger houses, cars, telephones, and gadgets. We are obsessed with the making of things and accumulation of things for ourselves. We must make up our minds whether we are going to continue making a full-time career of accumulating more things or whether we will stop at some reasonable point and examine our human relationships. Now today, in these frightening days of 1948, I feel sure of one shining truth that is a present, that is at present very much hidden under the bushel of loud continuous propaganda the truth that the peace of our world depends upon whether or not we Americans are going to stop ranting and panting and worrying about other less important and complicated, unrewarding matters and turn our attention and efforts toward the important, rewarding business of improving our human relations. If we Americans begin here and now to practice Americanism, and it is laid down in our beautiful and famous freedom document, if we treat all Americans and the people of the world as human beings to be accepted, I mean, we have to accept them anyway, they are here. Studied, understood, considered, respected as human beings, regardless of race, color, sex, or religious, political, economic, or cultural system, then we will have surely laid the solid foundation for peace peace within our individual selves, peace in our country, and peace in the world. So, Aslanda, tell me, who makes up the minds in a democracy? We, the people, we're supposed to. In theory, we sit down and we work out what we need, what we want, then select one of ourselves, our representatives, to see that we get it. But it is that what we do, but is that what we do here in America? No. Here we have the spectacle of professional politicians saying one thing and doing another, term after term. So much so that the phrase election promises is well understood by us all. The American people seem to have given over their affairs in the conduct of their country their lives and future, and now the conduct of world affairs to these professional politicians. It's a pity. I'm pretty cynical about it all. I say, 
if that's what the American people want, all right. I'm only one person, and who am I to tell them what they want? What do they know? I do very strongly object to all their bleeding all over the face of the earth about how democratic they are. Democratic indeed, with our staggering minority problems, with the corruption in our domestic and foreign affairs, and with the politicians, the military, the big businesses running the country and trying to run the world. We have the nerve to say we're democratic. What I can never get over is the fact that American people all over the is the fact that people all over the world see clearly and understand the state of affairs in American life, but Americans themselves refuse to admit it and characteristically refuse to face their contradictions. Perhaps this land is right. Indeed, I think she is. We Americans lack balance. And one reason we do is because we have no proper relationship between the young and the old. Competition does its evil work here too. Competition instead of cooperation. Islanda has the freedom of soul that comes from a sense of righteousness in herself and her people. It is not they who are the world's most hated kind. It is not they who are oppressing others. Islanda can afford to criticize and to rebel. When I do so, it means a profound self-criticism and a rendering of the spirit. It is my own and I who are wrong before the world's people. For me, all the fair and endearing aspects of my country are darkened by this knowledge. At any moment of joy and pride, I can fall into an abyss of despair. Are not our people kind and good? I have never seen better people in some ways than my neighbors, my kinfolk, my townsmen and women who live upon this piece of earth we call the United States. The germ of true democracy is here. Not all of us have the courage to speak against wrong, but some of us have enough so that the powers of evil dare not imprison us. Islanda is not a simple person, but she is direct and intensely practical. I avoided Soviet Russia talks with Islanda. She's not a communist. I would not have wanted to spend hours with her had she been one. For every communist I have ever met in any country has been a simple person whose thinking was fairly stereotyped. You know, it is surprising, interesting, and revealing that Pearl believes that she would not have wanted to spend hours with me if I were a communist. Here I am, Eslanda Cordova Good Robeson, a human being whom she likes, respects, and trusts. No matter what anyone may say or believe about me, I am nevertheless the same as Landa. And now here Pearl now here is Pearl, an intelligent, experienced, and sympathetic, wholly superior human being. And she says she would have slammed a door between us if she had believed I was a communist, whether I was or not. This kind of prejudice, which we Americans have been taught, staggers me at every point. It crops up in unexpected places in the most unlikely people. It proves what a thorough job has been done by propagandists on so many different levels. If Americans continue to slam doors around them against their fellow men of different colors, religions, economic and political beliefs, national origin, station in life, why then, very soon indeed, they will find themselves all by themselves in a badly ventilated room because they slammed all the doors. There they will first become lonesome and sick and will finally disintegrate. Had you been a communist, Islanda, I would have not slammed a door between us. I closed no door between any human being and myself, but I would have not have chosen to write this book with you. There are religious, political, military, and even economic systems which do change the personality. Were you communist, you would not be the same person I know as Islanda. 
Were you the devotee of a possessive church? Were you absorbed in self-devotion to money-making? Were you subject to a military machine? You would be changed. When the self is yielded up to the creed or cause or a system, the personality changes. It is no longer free. But can't we work for freedom? Isn't that an American right? Maybe you can, but I can't. But you do, Islanda, all the time. How? I take it our government is still the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. How do I fight them? On the contrary, how do I go around the country fighting for them? And fighting against whom? Against some of our so-called public servants, servants of the government who keep insisting upon denying me and a lot of other citizens our rights? I always stay well within the law, both the letter and spirit of the law. I admit that maybe some of our more reactionary servants of the government would like to put me in jail for these activities. And from time to time, the FBI has been interested in me, but they couldn't very well put me in prison without making themselves ridiculous. Being the wife of a celebrity, there is some publicity value attached to me and people might be interested in what happened to me and why. Suppose you had no publicity value. Well, then I could be lynched tomorrow in some parts of the South for my activity. But our government would never do anything to you. No. In lynching areas, isn't the sheriff the representative of the government? Sheriffs sometimes connive and even assist at lynching. We had a particularly unpleasant experience in the West some years ago when I was out on a concert tour with Paul and Larry. We arrived at a large town and we were met at the railroad station by the local concert manager. He told us that we were not going to be able to go to the hotel at which we had reservations as planned, but to the home of a very nice colored family. Now, we know that there was segregation in this town and that the Negro section was a slum. I got very angry about the whole business and told the manager who was white that we would definitely go to the hotel that it was charming of the family whom we did not know to offer us hospitality. And we were grateful for it, but we were very tired and we would just like to go to the facilities of the hotel. The manager hemmed and hawed and finally admitted that the hotel would not take us because we were colored. I said they had confirmed our reservation. Yes, but no buts, no, not this time I told them. No hotel, no concert, period. But you can't cancel your concert. You have a contract and we can sue you, said the manager. I'm glad you understand the law out here, I answered, because we have a contract with the hotel in the form of a confirmed reservation and will sue too. We have a very good lawyer in New York and so let's just turn it all over to the legal department and forget the whole thing until we meet in court. The manager went to the, tele went to the telephone um, to call the hotel to see what they could do. We knew the concert hall had been sold out for weeks in advance, and we felt sure the local people would not cancel it. Well, the hotel agreed to take us after all, and we got the suite we had reserved. The hotel manager asked us to use the freight elevator and not eat in the public dining room. The hotel manager and the local concert manager apologized for the necessity of all this and said the other guests would leave if we accepted Negroes. Later, when we came downstairs in the passenger elevator, and passed through the lobby and route to the concert hall, we were delayed for more than 15 minutes by the hotel guests who swarmed about Paul, greeted him, requesting autographs, requesting special favorites for encores, inviting him to supper following the concert. I shall always remember a man and wife and their three children, a charming family, who said to Paul, Mr. Robeson, we came to the hotel for dinner hoping to catch a glimpse of you in the dining room. 
It's very exclusive and selfish of you to eat in your rooms. These were some of the guests who'd leave if the hotel accepted Negroes. Eslanda, how does it happen that such persons as this hotel man gets into these seats of power, high and low throughout the country? I suppose because the average person is afraid or can't afford to take a stand against this kind of thing. And so it keeps on happening and finally freezes into a pattern that comes to be accepted. Then when some of us try to break the pattern, we're told people would never stand for that. They're not accustomed to that. Very few people can afford to protest to, change, to challenge the pattern. Some of those who can afford to will not for fear of losing what they have. We are very lucky. We can afford to, and we do. It was at that point that I realized that we should call our book The American Argument. Our country now is in a state where I realize that we must argue. We must discuss. I am very conservative in many ways because I was reared in conservative China, where revolution was looked upon as foolish and wasteful. The fact that you feel you must argue, that you must do something in spite of your conservatism is an indication of the seriousness of our time. There should be a feeling that we should not only just argue, but that we must change. These are heart searching days for me. I know Aslanda is telling the truth as she sees it, and that is not easy for her. She loves our country in her way as much as I do, but my way is not hers. I am slowly beginning to see that. Hers is a deep, bitter, strong love, shot through with pain. She has suffered at the hands of the country that she loves. Through no fault of her own, she is part of evil and shame. I, on the contrary, have received only benefits from being an American. It is my own fault that I am not content with this. I might, if I would, live a complete life in ease and pleasure, unaware of anything wrong inside of my country. Our attitude towards Americans who are Negro invalidates our democracy to ourselves and to other peoples, most of all whom are colored. It invalidates our democracy to ourselves because prejudice makes us fail to see a human being for what he is. Prejudice compels us to lump whole groups together as being beyond sympathy or understanding. This hardens the heart, not only to the despised ones, but towards all people. The heart cannot act upon the good principle of love. It is forced to divide itself to love only those few whose faces are thus and to refuse love to all except the chosen. As Landon and I have different, differed profoundly, it is impossible for us to agree upon our own country. No, not just our country, we have differed on the whole world. The conditions that make it impossible for us to see our country the same are conditions that hold in this world. Wherever Islanda and I might live, she and I would differ. We Americans must apply our wisdom to our world. We must not believe only in ourselves or that only we are right. When we are but one group among many in the world, we must be American and realize that only by group thinking, group discussion, group agreement, and compromise can we arrive at a state of mutual benefit and accord. So Islanda, I have one last question for you today. Can you see any advantage to being an American? No, but I am an American, as American as anybody else in this country. So there it is. It's like being a member of a family. You don't have to like your family if they aren't nice people, although you're supposed to. When they are mean and selfish and greedy and take advantage of you very often, how can you like them if you have any sense? but it's your family and you're stuck with it. Of course you defend it against outsiders and you do what you can for it. Well, that's the way I feel about America. It's the most basic reasoning, the most basic feeling. When Americans treat me and my people like Americans, then I like it and find advantage and pride in being American, but not before.
What an enlightening and inspiring conversation. So many lessons that still need to be learned and applied today. Thank you, ladies, for bringing Islanda and Pearl Buck to life for us this afternoon. We really, really appreciate it. You did such a great job. Thank you. Thank you.